One of the critical things to understand uh, with uh, atmospheric, uh, whether it's seasonal change uh, in terms of the warming or cooling or uh, anthropogenic forcing and global warming is the water vapor feedback. Uh, since water vapor is uh, the most important greenhouse gas, but it also moves energy uh, from the warm tropics to uh, higher latitudes, uh, and it's the most uh, one of the most nonlinear uh, variability in the atmosphere uh, in terms of. Uh, water vapor being picked up from the ocean, for example, condensing in the atmosphere, releasing heat, uh, producing waves and dynamic uh, circulation and so on. So when we look at water vapor in the air, we can look at uh, specific humidity or uh, relative uh, humidity. So here it's looking at grams of H2O per kilogram of air. So it's a ratio called specific humidity to uh, saturation uh, humidity. So how much water vapor can the air hold when it's completely saturated versus how much is actually present. Uh, so this is 100% relative humidity curve or the uh, dew point. Uh, so you can see that the temperature, uh, as temperature increases, uh, amount of water vapor the air can hold obviously goes up and drier air has uh, very little water vapor in it and can get bone dry when you get to polar temperatures of minus 20 and uh, minus 10 and so on. And the relative humidity, if it is, let's say, at 50% where uh, the actual specific humidity in the air is only 50% of uh, the full saturation humidity, then the slope is uh, quite different. So if you are somewhere here and you want to uh, saturate the air, you can either increase the water vapor in it somehow by let's say fluxing it in, or you can cool the air and bring it uh, down to a cooler temperature where you reach uh, saturation. Okay, so that's just something to remember and similar things work for uh, relative humidity as well. There are details, for example, as global warming happens, I've already mentioned several times that warm air holds more water vapor and this is going to uh, drive uh, snowfall over the glaciers, glacier growth, uh, and uh, the buildup of uh, glacier gets slower because as cooling happens and glaciation sets in, air gets colder, it holds less moisture, so snowfall rates fall, uh, etc. In the global warming scenario, uh, as warming happens, saturation humidity goes up uh, as well as uh, specific humidity goes up. So relative humidity doesn't necessarily go up as much as uh, you would think, uh, except there is a difference also between land and ocean because ocean has uh, lots of uh, basically infinite moisture supply, whereas land doesn't. So those sorts of details begin to matter when we look at um, precipitation responses. But precipitation response can be understood in terms of the uh, uh, exponential relation between temperature and uh, water vapor. Okay, so uh, the water vapor or uh, vapor pressure in the air is some constant A times exponential times beta, another constant times, let's say, temperature. I'm just doing it by hand because you can imagine, uh, you can write it down. It's basically a, an equation that fits uh, this curve. I should have written it down, but you can look it up and I have it in other podcasts uh, in the atmospheric circulation course. Uh, so if you want to look for the, the uh, humidity response to change in temperature, you would take a derivative of that, uh, basically delta ES or delta T, which is uh, the uh, saturation uh, water vapor water vapor pressure uh, with respect to temperature change and you can, since it's an exponential, it ends up being delta ES or ES is approximately equal to uh, gamma times delta T where gamma is uh, 0 0.07 per Kelvin. Basically that means for each degree change you're going to get 7% uh, 
humidity increase. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a very non-linear thing. One degree change is going to get 7% increase in uh, humidity. And if you look at the water vapor, uh, water budget in the atmosphere, uh, you can think of divergence of flux uh, from any place is a net balance of E minus P. So how much is evaporating and how much is precipitating back is going to determine how much flux is going, how much water vapor flux is going to leave that, uh, let's say, water uh, air column. Okay, so the flow patterns or the dynamics uh, of the wind's uh, circulation doesn't change so much, so moisture fluxes do not change significantly, which means it's an approximation they don't change significantly. So we can approximate the divergence of uh, water vapor here as uh, uh, delta ES or ES times F. Um, so that uh, gives you uh, the fact that the uh, delta T is going to basically project onto um, gamma times delta T times the flux. Okay, so you have a flux and you want to see the change in the flux, right? So basically it, it means that the change of uh, the freshwater flux, which you can think of E minus P, uh, to warming of the, uh, the air is going to depend on the flux itself and uh, the warming uh, rate, delta T, times gamma, which is 0 0.07 per Kelvin. Okay, so this is s simple, but there are many papers written on the details of how this works on land and on ocean and so on. And you can already see here that there are huge differences between what happens on the ocean where there is infinite supply of moisture and on land where advective fluxes of uh, water vapor become very critical for how precipitation responds. For example, if you warm uh, the air on the ocean, it can begin to pick up a, wa a water vapor locally, whereas if it happens on land, then it can demand moisture, but the moisture has to be brought in from uh, ocean or lake or somewhere else because the soil moisture that's there to supply the warming doesn't necessarily meet the demand that is created by the warming. Okay, So essentially that means delta P minus E is proportional to or basically equal to gamma times delta T times P minus E. Okay, so it's a, a fairly uh, direct relationship. This also means that regions which precipitate tend to precipitate more with the warming and regions that are evaporating and supplying the moisture to the precipitating regions, let's say the ITCZ, uh, are going to uh, supply more water vapor for generating that more rainfall. So essentially this is what is referred to as rich get richer and poor get poorer syndrome in global warming. Uh, there are many, many, many details. For example, this doesn't tell you the, anything about the rain rate, for example. For that, you can think of a warm uh, atmosphere as a sponge and when the water is poured onto the sponge, it soaks it up, but when you push on the sponge somewhere, it's going to drop lots of water in one place. It's not going to drizzle uniformly because of the fluid mechanics that happens. So this pushing on the sponge can be considered as an instability in the atmosphere that generates rainfall, not just because of warming, but in general the process of rainfall from the clouds relates to uh, all sorts of instabilities that we are not going to get into. Uh, depends on the buoyancy of the parcel, uh, the region where it gets uh, saturated and then uh, converts back into rain and falls down and so on and so forth. So you can see here projection of time series of uh, EOF, an empirical orthogonal function of uh, the sea surface temperature on a precipitation product called GPCP rainfall. Okay, so 
you can obviously see the ITCZ, you can see the SPCZ, you can see the Indian Ocean rainfall, uh, and so on. So this is uh, the spatial pattern of trend in rainfall associated with the trend in uh, EOF1 uh, we saw for the uh, sea surface temperature. Okay, So it gives you a sense that things are not simple. The subtropical gyres are the evaporative regions which are not receiving as much more rainfall as uh, the ITCZ, SPCZ and so on are receiving and the Amazonia, West African monsoon uh, region. Indian, Ocean, Indian uh, monsoon region is complicated. Uh, the west coast here gets some rainfall and the Bay of Bengal gets some rainfall because the moisture supply onto land here is complicated by uh, the Western Ghats on this side, the Himalayan mountains there, the Burmese mountain over here, the African highlands here, and so on and so forth. So we are simplifying it a little bit, but precipitation projections are really, really difficult for the models. Temperatures have large decorrelation scales, so temperature can be the same from this town to the next, but it could be raining only in part of this town and not at all in other parts or in the other town. So rainfall is like popcorn that just pops, convection happens, especially in the tropics, whereas in the mid-latitudes the systems tend to be uh, different. Okay. So let's look at the seasonal cycle of uh, the sea surface temperature, total uh, column water vo uh, vapor and precipitation, which we looked at before. Uh, you can see that going from uh, the winter boreal winter month to the uh, boreal summer month, there is large scale warming happening in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so can that be used as an analog for global warming? Um, not quite. It, 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 uh, the dynamics are quite different in the way uh, global warming uh, is distributed over uh, the planet and the dynamic and thermodynamic responses. So the circulation change versus the water vapor dynamics that happen tend to be different. Uh, so you can see the scale selection here again. The total column uh, water vapor in millimeters is uh, basically reflective of the ITCZ and the storm track. And you can see that the storm track is getting rainfall, but doesn't show up m as much of a uh, uh, water vapor in the uh, column. So it is the fluxing in and the storm tracks that drag in the moisture to create these uh, precipitation uh, storms here versus the rainfall here that is associated with moisture loading of uh, the free troposphere, for example. And of course, you can see that during the boreal winter, uh, ITCZ is to the south, the northern ITCZ here gets weaker, and everything moves to the north and gets very strong. So the asymmetry we always talk about is the fact that the ITCZ here remains to the north of the uh, equator predominantly. And as I said before, uh, earlier theories argued that more land in the northern hemisphere and the lower heat capacity of the land, so warmer temperatures were argued to be important, but newer studies show that it's the thermohaline circulation which we now learned and the associated heat transport by the ocean across the equator, in fact from the colder hemisphere into the warmer northern hemisphere. So ocean is mechanically being forced by the atmosphere to carry energy into a warmer uh, hemisphere, so that energy has to be moved back for equilibrium and ITCZ does that as we saw with the cross-equatorial flow uh, of the Hadley cell uh, by season. Okay, so I will stop this here and we will move on to terrestrial biosphere. Uh, this podcast is getting to 14 minutes, but the, the, the concepts are important and uh, you make sure uh, you understand those uh, correctly.